feel very privileged today to be able to chair a panel that I think is going to ask some of the questions that are absolutely fundamental to understanding the current political situation in Iraq. We're going to be asking about the extent to which Iraq's political dysfunction stems from its structure as a nascent rentier state, and what the impact of the personalities that are the leading of the, pers the personalities of Iraq's leading politicians have on the Iraq's on Iraq's political process. We're going to be discussing the role of sectarianism in Iraq's political landscape and in particular, the inability of Iraq's sectarian and ethnic groups to admit the victimhood of others. And we're going to be exploring the impact of Iraq's political system, constitution, and particularly its federalism on some of the more intractable problems that define contemporary Iraqi politics. To guide us through the discussion today, we have three excellent speakers who are really at the cutting edge of analysis on Iraq and of the wider region. Fana Haddad, who is based at the Middle East Institute in Singapore, is the author of one of the most important books on Iraq published in the last five years. The book, titled Sectarianism in Iraq, Antagonistic Visions of Unity, is a deeply intelligent examination of the competing nationalist narratives of Iraq's two major sects, and I think it's a must read for every serious Iraq analyst. Haider al Khoi is a well-respected researcher based at the Center for Academic Shiite Studies here in London, and he's a familiar face at Chatham House. Haider is a prolific speaker, writer, twitterer, and commentator on Iraq affairs, and is known for offering a thoughtful, balanced, and much-needed intelligent voice in the debate. Zaid Al Ali is a senior advisor on constitution, on constitution building for International IDEA and offers this session a wealth of expertise on constitution writing processes from around the Arab world and was a legal advisor to the UN in Iraq from 2005 to 2010. I'm going to ask each speaker to give some introductory remarks for five to seven minutes and then I will open up the discussion with questions. Before I start, can I just ask you to turn off your mobile phones? For now, please, can we start with you? Thank you, Nasoba. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back in London. Uh, I've actually just returned from Iraq, where I was doing some research and trying to keep up to date with the ever-changing dynamics of sectarian relations. And it might be worth underlining that uh, sectarian relations are ever-changing. Since 2003, they've undergone several phases all of which are underlined by the fact that the political system born uh, 10 years ago in Iraq is one based on ethno-sectarian apportionment. In other words, despite the rhetoric, identity politics are not an aberration in the new Iraq. They're a part of the state's political DNA. So from entrenchment in 2003 to 2005, to civil war in 06, 07, to retreat in 08, 09, Sectarian relations then seem to settle on a less than ideal modus vivendi following the controversial 2010 elections. However, today, the ongoing protests in Anbar and elsewhere are raising fears amongst Iraqis that perhaps sectarian relations are on the cusp of a new phase that threatens to further destabilize Iraqi politics. Now, one of the problems with these protests is that they are Sunni protests. Hence, regardless of their intentions, they will be divisive. Now, why are they Sunni protests? It's not just that the protesters happen to be Sunnis, nor is it just the sometimes questionable uh, symbolism and rhetoric. It is that the protests, to a large extent, revolve around Sunni victimhood. Now, that's perfectly legitimate, but in Iraq, competing victimhoods are so pronounced and so politicized that publicly championing one is a trigger for immediate sectarian entrenchment. Which is why, even though rare is the Iraqi who is happy with this government, a Shi'i sympathizing with these protests is even rarer. And uh, this is particularly unfortunate given that quite a few of the grievances are actually shared by the vast majority of Iraqis regardless of ethno-sectarian identity. However, in my view, three things stand in the way of cross-sectarian solidarity. Firstly, the ever-present competition of sectarian victimhoods that has been so characteristic of post-2003 Iraq makes cross-sectarian sympathy unlikely. Secondly, views regarding the legitimacy of the post-2003 order play a role. 
Um, for all its flaws, the new Iraq is seen as the guarantor of Shiism in Iraq by a significant body of Shia opinion. Hence, any threat to the political order, real or perceived, will be viewed as a personal threat by such people. And finally, the very nature of the political system militates against uh, national solidarity. Now, some of the protesters' grievances are inescapably linked to Sunni identity. And here I'm particularly thinking of uh, anti-terrorism legislation and to issues relating to de But even with regards to um, uh, issues that are, affect all Iraqis, things like services, corruption, bad governance, and so on, the situation is complicated by the fact that sectarian identity in the new Iraq very easily intrudes upon perceptions. So for example, a Basrawi or someone from Diwaniya would see his city's shocking state of dilapidation as the result of corruption or theft or poor governance or what have you. Whereas an Anbari or someone from Mosul is much more likely to see the same dilapidation in their cities as the result of sectarian discrimination. And the reason for this is that a significant body of Sunni opinion views the current order as inherently anti-Sunni. Uh, a, be a belief that is based in some very real examples of marginalization and sectarian discrimination. At the same time, this is all exacerbated by the fact, and, and this isn't just relevant to Iraq, elsewhere as well, the fact that the underdog in sectarian dynamics, whether it's the Shia before 2003 or the Sunni since 2003, the underdog cannot seem to voice a dissenting political opinion without being labeled and bracketed, often unjustly, as being sectarian. Which brings us back to the nature of the political system. It seems that in today's Iraq, political difference will inevitably be accompanied by sectarian entrenchment unless, unless the protagonists are of the same ethno-sectarian group. And that, to me, seems about as counterproductive a formula for politics as one can conceive of. Now, the fact that all of this is happening in election season makes it all the more pronounced and supports the view that, for the new Iraq, elections have been as much a curse as they have been a blessing. With the sole exception of the 2009 provincial elections, every single round of elections have been accompanied by sectarian entrenchment. And indeed, today we see many political and religious figures on both sides of the sectarian divide, emphasizing the sectarian side of the protests in order to rally some otherwise very undeserved support. In addition to that, developments in neighboring Syria, a source of sometimes fantastical Iraqi hopes or fears, depending on who you ask, have added to the toxicity of sectarian dynamics in Iraq. Now, what I find myself asking is how many electoral rounds and how many rounds of sectarian entrenchment can Iraqi nationalism withstand? And there are enough actors in Iraq and beyond whose political fortunes are served by sectarian entrenchment to ensure that this pattern continues. And hence, many people see an uncertain future for Iraqi nationalism and Iraqi identity. Only time will tell how that will pan out. Now, regarding the future of these protests, uh, as others have mentioned, uh, or other, as others have commented, the protests seem to have reached a dead end. Uh, there's no way that their demands will be met, particularly their more maximalist demands. And the Iraqi government has little incentive to compromise, at least not before the upcoming provincial elections, and perhaps not even before the parliamentary elections. Uh, nevertheless, despite that, the protests are set to continue. A combination of good funding on the one hand and political intransigence on the other means that the protests are not going away anytime soon. Now, I'm not normally one to make predictions regarding Iraq's future, but here goes. Uh, whatever happens uh, with these protests, I do not see a return to 06, 07. I think the state is simply too strong for something like that to happen again. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that renewed sectarian violence is impossible, just that it would have to uh, take on a different form. Equally possible is that the protests will eventually fizzle out as a result of uh, concessions or some backroom elite dealings or just fatigue or a combination thereof. My money says that if and when the protests end, it will not mean that the root cause of the crisis has been resolved. As is the case with many pressing issues in Iraqi politics, when a crisis passes, it usually means an agreement has been reached to delay resolution rather than achieve it. Which makes me sometimes harbor some serious doubts about the long-term sustainability of the entire post-2003 political order. Without addressing many of the, the many structural problems that have festered for 10 years, 
I fear that there's dark clouds on Iraq's political horizon. In fact, I'd argue that sectarian entrenchment is simply the most immediate and visible symptom of a broader illness, namely the profoundly flawed political system upon which the new Iraq is based and the entrenched obstacles standing in the way of meaningful reform. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for now. <clears throat>
Ayatollah Sistani made uh, uh, a couple of interventions, or a, a, a few interventions, I, su I should say, uh, at the uh, beginning. Sistani's uh, interventions forced the occupation authorities uh, to, uh, um, to hold direct elections much earlier than they would have liked. And he forced them to abandon their plans of appointing a group to write the constitution. Yeah, Sergio De Milo, Sergio De Milo the UN uh, uh, envoy who was tragically killed in the summer, actually went to Sistani and said, um, Sayyidna, I hear you want Iraqis to write the co uh, constitution. Uh, Sistani held the translator's hand and said, no, I want elected Iraqis to write the constitution. And as Larry Diamond, uh, who was involved in the process, has written in his memoir, uh, Sistani repeatedly assumed positions that were more pro-democratic than the United States uh, itself. Now, the Iraqi National Alliance, the quote-unquote Shia Alliance, uh, was set up in Sistani's uh, home. Election posters, if you remember from 2005, uh, carried his picture, uh, and the Shia politicians did use uh, the Merja'iyah to gain uh, legitimacy. Now, Sistani prevented, and again, this may be lost on people, he prevented the sectarian conflict in Iraq from turning into a genocide. Following the attacks in summer in 2006, uh, at that point, the Shia who were involved uh, in violence were the militant groups. They weren't your ordinary uh, laymen. They weren't the ordinary Shia masses. But following the attack on Samara, uh, there was an uproar in the Shia community. And we have tribes from the south, and the history books uh, will one day write the, 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 the tribal leaders and the scholars who accompanied them. They came to Sistani and said, enough is enough. We've kept quiet for three years. Uh, the, the Sunnis, Al-Qaeda, the insurgents, the former Ba'athist officials, they've been constantly attacking us, beheading our followers, blowing up our mosques. We need to act. Had Sistani kept silent, um, you would have seen a totally different uh, Iraq in 2006. Um, and, I mean, you've all seen the, the, the millions, or you've probably all seen the millions of uh, Shia pilgrims who peacefully march to Karbala uh, every year. Some say five, some say 10, some say 15 million. So you can sort of imagine what would have happened had these 15 million Shia been angry, armed, and, and given the green light from Sistani to march to Samara uh, through Baghdad. And of course, Sistani's famous quote uh, in trying to pacify and calm down the Shia said, the Sunnis of Iraq are not our brothers, they are ourselves. However, following sort of this period of, of direct intervention, the Marja'iyah has taken a step back uh, from Iraqi politics, and this is due to the uh, um, a dismal performance uh, of the uh, Iraqi government, which sort of came uh, to power under the auspices of the religious establishment. Uh, but because of the, their failure to provide even the most basic services and security for its citizens, Sistani has boycotted politicians. He will, he will not meet them. His son might meet them, but usually it will be in somebody else's house. Politicians are, are, are uh, forbidden from entering uh, Sistani's uh, house. And during Friday prayer sermons, Sistani's representatives uh, continually criticize uh, the performance of the government. Um, now, today, the Marja'iyah has uh, given a, a series of recommendations to the government, which, if not taken seriously, um, could um, see Iraq go down a very uh, dark and bloody path. Regarding the, the protest, the Sunni protest, and I know some people think the Shia do not or do not want to sympathize, but Sistani has told the government it should meet the protesters' demands. Now, that doesn't mean, as, as Fanny rightly suggested, all the, uh, the, the maximalist demands they want, the uh, abolition of the Article 4 of the terrorism law, but Sistani has said to the government, as long as these uh, demands do not contradict law or the constitution, you should meet them. Now, for Sistani, the dissolving of parliament, which was a threat which was initially suggested by the Islamic Da'wah Party, uh, Sistani made it very clear to Maliki's delegation that this would be a red line uh, and they should not contemplate uh, dissolving parliament. He's called for a civil state, not a religious state. And again, that indicates um, the difference uh, uh, of opinion with Iran. He has refused the internationalization uh, of the crisis and any foreign interference wherever it comes from. And he has stated the political conflict should not be sectarianized domestically, and, and whatever disagreements the politicians have should not spill over onto the streets. I'd just like to conclude by saying the Merja'iyah today, Merja today is in a very awkward position. It's between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, they very clearly do not want to see a return to one man, one party rule, under whoever it may be. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, the collapse of the political order is a red line, and they will uh, uh, make sure that 
things will not uh, escalate to an extent where the, the political order um, uh, collapses. And though the Marja'iyah only gets uh, involved in politics quite reluctantly when it sees itself forced to intervene, uh, we can ex expect it to continue playing a uh, moderating role should the conflict in Iraq take a turn for the worse. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Haider. <clears throat> Zaid, can I ask you to continue? I will. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be part of such a young panel of Iraqis. Uh, it's, a, it's a first for me, at least. <laughs> Um, I won't be engaging in the type of discourse that we've been hearing so far today, which is the sectarian discourse. I won't be using either the dreaded S-words or the K-word today. I'll be uh, sticking with my expertise, which is I'm a lawyer. I, I focus on constitutional issues, so that's what I'll be focusing on. And one of the reasons why I'll be doing that is because other countries in the world have had far worse divisions than we have had in Iraq. Uh, in Africa, I'm thinking specifically about South Africa and Kenya, and amongst many, many others, and they have overcome their divisions. Not perfectly, albeit, of course, but they have made very good progress. There are far worse divisions than we have, um, and, and yet we are simply incapable of overcoming this discourse that we're constantly going back to. It's important, we have to engage in it, but uh, it's uh, something that we, uh, we, 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 we wouldn't necessarily have to if we had better leadership, which is what I will be focusing on today. We have an annual state budget, which has uh, reached astronomical proportions in comparison to our history. We have a constitution that was approved by 80% of the population, but we have a dysfunctional government, we have corruption, and we have uh, political tensions that apparently never cease to increase. Why? There are many reasons. One of the reasons why is the constitution. One of the questions that was put in this, uh, the agenda for this session is does federalism still offer a governance solution? And the answer to that is yes, it does. Federalism does. Decentralization also does. There are many different forms of governance that offer solutions for Iraq, but not the form of federalism or not the form of decentralization that are provided for under our constitution. And I'll explain a little bit why. First of all, by explaining the background to how the constitution was put together, and then by providing some examples of what's wrong with it. So the first issue, the first problem with our constitution was that it was rushed, rushed. It was ra drafted in six months, officially, but unofficially in far less time than six months. We only worked for a small proportion of that time. Other countries, in comparison, worked for years. A multi-party negotiation, particularly after a long period of despotic rule, takes years. In South Africa, it took seven years. In Kenya, about the same amount of time. In other countries, years. In Iraq, we drafted our constitution in a matter of weeks, and in weeks, what that means is that you leave gaps open that only come to the surface afterwards. The other main feature of our constitutional drafting process, and this is going to come as a surprise to many people, particularly after Haider's comments earlier, is that our drafting process was undemocratic. And what I mean by that is that although we had elections, and that officially the people who drafted our constitution were elected, because of the timeline and because of the fact that we were forced to finish by August and because of the fact that we could not finish by August because of the fact that it was complicated, we couldn't reach an agreement, the Constitutional Drafting Committee was dissolved and replaced by a small group of people that held extremist views and very undemocratic views, okay, and who was satisfied, who took control over the constitutional drafting process and reshaped the Constitution to satisfy narrow interests, which I'll be uh, going over slightly now. And those are reflected partially in our system of federalism, which is included in our Constitution which is the first example of why, of what I, that I'm going to be giving now, why our constitution is dysfunctional. So our system of governance, our federal system of government, was conceived at a time of worsening violence. It was getting worse and worse on a day-to-day -day basis in 2005. And the conception was is that we have an example in Iraq, the Kurdistan region, where violence was not a problem. So why not replicate that, that system of government elsewhere in the country? so that we could have an equivalent amount of safety everywhere in the country. So instead of the Kurdistan region being an exception, it was uniformized throughout the country. But you really have to imagine what this means. The Kurdistan region was cut off from Baghdad for a long period of time for uh, understandable historic reasons. Okay? But as an exception, that's fine. As a single area in the country that has a unique relationship with Baghdad, that's understandable and workable. But if the whole country were to have the equivalent relationship with Baghdad, that means you no longer have a country. That means you have 
different parts of the country which have no relationship with each other and no relationship with the capital. On the other hand, what you have is that you have uh, a government that is made up by elites who have no understanding of decentralization or federalism themselves. Their version of decentralization is for central government ministries to send representatives at, local, at a local level to implement projects at a local level without any input from local people. Okay. And in that context, local elections are meaningless. What you have is you have local elections to elect local politicians who have no power, apart from a very small number of areas where you have petrodollars that they can use to spend, and that's it. Okay. So, uh, for example, we heard earlier today from Ambassador Collis' remarks that he's been hearing that over the past few weeks we've been hearing a little bit more about uh, some powers possibly being devolved to the local level and that maybe Baghdad's powers will be reduced slightly. With all due respect, I've been hearing that for years now. I've been hearing that since 2005. Recently, in, uh, I received a phone call from, from former colleagues of the United Nations who told me that they were going to accompany a group of Iraqi MPs to Berlin to organize a study tour there in which they were going to debate the uh, decentralization and the formation of a second chamber. And they asked me whether I would be interested in participating. And my immediate response to that was, what is going to be the difference between that study tour and the dozens of study tours that we've had since 2005? We have not made any progress in devolution, in decentralization, in the formation of, central, of a second chamber since 2005. Absolutely none. We've had study tours, conferences in Switzerland, in Canada, in Australia, in Germany, and the, uh, the, uh, all of which have, uh, have amounted to little more than holidays for Iraqi MPs. Okay. The second example that I want to give of why the Constitution is dysfunctional is the relationship with the armed forces. So many people have complained recently that, the, that Prime Minister Maliki has uh, overstepped his mandate as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces and has taken control over uh, army divisions. Now, the problem with that, that perspective is that what he's doing is not, strictly speaking, in violation of the Constitution. Because what does the Constitution say about his responsibility as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces? It doesn't say anything. It only says that he's Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces with no explanation whatsoever. There isn't a constitutional provision. There isn't a legal provision. There isn't a regulation that says anything about how he is supposed to exercise his authority as Commander-in-Chief. So it's not legal, perhaps, it's not certainly not illegal. So there's not much to complain about, at least from the perspective of the Constitution. Had the Constitution been drafted more seriously, then we could have had uh, provisions that are similar to what, what exists in other countries. For example, national security councils, detailed provisions about how armed forces are supposed to be used, the circumstances in, how, in which they're supposed to be exercised, the operating procedures, the lines of command, all of those in post-dictatorial settings are detailed over pages and pages in modern constitutions. In Iraq, we have one line. Okay. Another example is the courts. So what does the Iraqi constitution say about the courts? We heard about that earlier today, about the fact that the Iraqi government is now seizing control over the courts. What does the constitution say about the courts? It says that the courts are independent. Fine. That's what the 1970 constitution said about the, the courts. Now, what else does it say? It says that the independence and the way in which that independence will be organized will be regulated by law. Fine. Who organizes the legal process, the lawmaking process, according to the Constitution? The Constitution says that the government does. Only the government has authority to regulate laws and to pass laws under the Constitution. So what it effectively means is that the independence of the, of the, of the courts is under the authority of the government. So strictly speaking, if the government has influence over the courts, it's because the Constitution is shoddy. Now, none of what, have, uh, what I've discussed, and there are many other problems that I haven't discussed, are a secret. We've known about these things for many, many years. We've been talking about them since the day on which the, draft, the, the Constitution entered into force. Many proposals have been made. So many have been signed off on by some politicians. And yet, no progress has been made over the past eight years. Okay? Now, the question for me is not what solutions, because we know what the solutions are, but how can we reach the point where the solutions can come into effect? How can we expect for the current group of people who haven't been making any progress for the past eight years to suddenly reach a point of enlightenment and reach a solution today? How can we peacefully transfer power to a different group of people who will be more capable 
of reaching a solution in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much to our speakers. I think, as I promised, we have started to get to the nub of some of the most complicated and intractable issues that are at the heart of Iraq's current political crisis. And I just want to dig a little bit deeper with our speakers before opening up to questions. For now, I wanted to ask you about the level of support for Prime Minister Maliki in his core Shiite constituencies. Has there been any holding of account to Prime Minister Maliki for the dismal performance on services and on the sheer scale of corruption that we're seeing in Iraqi politics? Why aren't we seeing the emergence of a strong, uh, popular Shiite politician who is taking Maliki to task on these issues? And is it pie in the sky to think that a Shiite leader could emerge with a strong Shiite constituency who tries to reach out to the Sunni and Kurdish communities as well? Um, I mean, I think these, these protests in Western Iraq are a godsend for Maliki. Uh, because my view is that Shiite or Sunni, the level of dissatisfaction uh, amongst Iraqis is sky high. Um, I, I, I spent most of my time in the mid-Euphrates and in the south and the amount of complaints and the number of times I heard the phrase, what did we get out of 2003? From military officials to civilians to policemen to you name it. It just kept coming up again and again and again. So the natural question is, well, why don't you go out in solidarity with the Western provinces against uh, the current government? Um, it's the sectarian bogeyman that keeps them away. They make mention of the uh, old Iraqi flag, the uh, Free Syrian Army's flag, some of the rhetoric, um, out of fear of the sectarian other, and this is on a collective basis rather than on an individual basis, I should stress, uh, they will rally around a state that they feel is uh, less than adequate, nevertheless legitimate. So they, they have their problems with the government, but not with the state. Now, is it pie in the sky for, for a figure to emerge? I mean, no, it can happen. It's, it's, uh, it's possible. Uh, but at the moment, I can't see it happening in, in this current climate, with elections coming up, with the, with the protests in, in, uh, in full, full swing. I can't see it happening at the moment. Thanks. And Haida, um, there's clearly a tension in the relationship between Sistani and Prime Minister Maliki. To what extent is Sistani acting as a restraint on Maliki's exercise or abuse of power at the moment. And you said that the Marja'iyah's red line was going to be the collapse of the political order. Do you have a sense what it would take for them to see the political order as collapsing and what it is that you would expect them to do in that situation? And finally, do you have any thoughts on who is going to replace Ayatollah Sistani when he dies and with what implications for the Iraqi political scene? I think on the first point, I did mention the, uh, the calls to dissolve parliament. Sistani came out very strongly, and it is worth mentioning uh, the two people who Maliki sent to speak to Sistani. One was Dr. Hussein Sharistani, who was the previous uh, uh, oil minister, and he's currently extremely powerful in the uh, energy sector, but also he's heading the... Um, the committee to look into the, the ministerial committee to look into what's happening in the protest. And the second was Sheikh Halim al-Zuhairi, who is Maliki's right-hand man when it comes to intra-Shia, uh, uh, Iran-Iraq, Iraq-Syria relations. These are two very uh, uh, people who are very close to Maliki in his inner circle. They flew to Najaf to meet Sistani, and Sistani refused to meet them. This is a very uh, a, a clear signal the Merja'i is sending to the political class. Instead, there was a sort of halfway solution. What Sistani done was sent his eldest son, said Muhammad Radha Sistani, who's also the, the head of his office, to Sheikh Fayyad's house, who is the other Grand Ayatollah in Najaf. And he made it very clear to them that these protesters, um, uh, their demands should be met. Um, you guys have um, taken Iraq down a path where corruption is, is, the, is the norm. It's not the exception. And I think if it wasn't for this um, sort of religious oversight, the people who today claim Malik is a dictator um, would, would have some very serious uh, concerns about what his ambitions are in Iraq if it wasn't for the, uh, the check the Merja'iya places uh, on Iraq's political class. In terms of uh, Sistani's, um, after Sistani, who would come to his place? I mean, it's, 
it's not really my place to speculate on names, um, but I would say there is a system in Najaf, maybe it's not a formal system, and hence why a lot of people misunderstand it, but it's a very slow, tedious process to get to the level of Sistani, or even below Sistani. There's been a lot of media speculation. The first one I read actually was uh, in the Saudi press, which I don't think was a coincidence, about Iran's sort of plan to, to, to parachute a cleric into Najaf and somehow control uh, uh, the Shia world because they'll have Qom and they'll have uh, Najaf as well. It is actually quite ridiculous because it's, and the person they were claiming would be in this position was Ayatollah Shahudi, who's a very well respected scholar, don't get me wrong, but his political connections with Iran compromise and they will compromise for any cleric who wants to assume um, Sistani's position. In Najaf we have four grand Ayatollahs, uh, Ayatollah Hakim, Ayatollah Fayyad, Ayatollah Najafi, I, I assume it will be one of these uh, three who takes the, the helm of the Shia spiritual um, position. Um, yeah. Thanks, Haida. Um, Zaid, you talked about the culture of centralization amongst Iraq's political elite and also about the constitution being unfit for purpose. If you were to give some policy prescriptions to Iraq's current, current political elite, what would they be? And how would you articulate them in a way that makes them in the interests of, of that elite? Why should it be a priority for them? I mean, it, the second part of your, your, your question is very difficult because they, their interest is in maintaining the status quo. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they have it fine in the way, the way it is currently. You know, they don't have the, the type of background that they would need. They don't have the know-how. They don't have the, 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 the knowledge in order to improve you know, their performance. So it's in their interest for things to stay very tense for there to be sectarian problems in the country, uh, for there to be you know the, the, the types of the types of issues that we keep on talking about. Um, the, the, the worst period for them perhaps was the period between 2009 and 2010, where violence decreased significantly, and the discourse became suddenly about corruption, mm -hmm. and it became about services, and then the electoral process and the campaigns were all about those two issues. Okay. Um, and then when the results weren't in their favor, then we, we, we turned back to sectarianism. The sorts of policy, policy prescriptions that you, I mean, there are all sorts of options that you can imagine, you know, it's like, but one would definitely be to devolve more authority, and more power to, to a local level. That's a trend that's taking place worldwide in all parts of the world. The only restraint that you, would, uh, you could imagine um, that, that might apply in, in, to, to any country to decentralization is, uh, is finance, because decentralization is expensive, but that's not a problem that we have. Um, so, you know, you know, we can afford it. The know-how will come with time. So, you know, we should, we should engage with it. Mm -hmm. But it's not coming because, you know, it's not, the, it's, it's, not the, it's not the mindset. And it's not in their interest. You know, their interest is to maintain the status quo. And for as long, uh, for as, long as they monopolize power, we will continue in the status quo. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, we have just over half an hour for questions. And I'd like to start with you in the front. Could you please introduce yourself? Uh, Lua, okay, from Iraq Energy Institute. Uh, I would like to just briefly comment on uh, Mr. Zaid Al Ali's uh, uh, points uh, on federalism and the application of, of uh, executing the uh, constitutional articles. Uh, although Iraq is federal on paper, but when it comes to application, never being given the chance to exercise that federal formula, still thriving on central. Uh, practices of legacy regimes and uh, apparently the existing um, uh, ruling powers enjoying that uh, centralist uh, formula and this uh, may be an explanation of uh, why these problems are happening um, I mean I've heard earlier from the previous panels that uh, from uh, uh, represent from the government says one of the solutions is to grant more authority to the provinces. Well, these are like not solution. These are constitutional rights that uh, that all these provinces been deprived to exercise since January 2006. Now, going back to the uh, federal uh, courts, I totally agree that uh, the constitution may uh, put some sort of vagueness or left unanswered questions. But when it comes to the federal courts, uh, the the parliament and I, I can't remember the exact number of the article. Uh, by 10 uh, MPs, uh, by the authority of 10 MPs, can table a, a law. And dozens of laws uh, being passed, 
and the government did not interfere of these laws. They only interfere on, on, on bills that could affect uh, the vision of the ruling parties or party, uh, such as the revenue sharing law, hydrocarbon law, and, and, and the federal court, the constitution of the federal court. On the last point, uh, the uh, authority of the chief of armed forces. Yes, the constitution may be silent on that, but that was left to the uh, bylaws of the council of ministers uh, um, uh, to be defined. But we don't have uh, uh, bylaws. And the previous uh, uh, administration and the current administration, of, of which both man, uh, headed by Mr. Maliki, have failed drastically to put a bylaw uh, setting because that bylaw will define the authority of that council of ministers and, and, and the jurisdiction of, of, of that authority. Uh, uh, and that's why you have a, an, a chaotic administration and even like the numbers of deputy prime ministers is becoming a de facto of like, uh, this is the deputy prime minister for investment or services or whatever. There is nothing uh, as such. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks. Would you like to respond to that, Zaid? Yeah, sure. Um, in relation to the, the authority to, 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 to pass legislation, what the Constitution says is that MPs can pass a muqtarah, okay, and not a mashru'ah. Okay? So the, the difference in terminology is they can table a, an initiative, legislative initiative, not a bill. Okay? So what that technically means is that uh, in order for a, a muqtarah, an initiative, to become a bill, has to go through government first. Okay? Now, it's true that sometimes votes take place in parliament and government doesn't interfere. Okay, it's true that sometimes they don't. Okay? But whenever it interferes with, as you say, the government's vision, they interfere, they appeal to the federal Supreme Court, and they cancel the, the, the law, even though it's approved by all MPs or most MPs or so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, then in relation to the, the commander in chief and bylaws and so on and so forth, yes, I completely agree, okay? Um, and normally what would happen in other countries is that in order to avoid these problems, in order to avoid the problem of leaving the ordinary political process, the opportunity to sabotage you know, armed forces is that you would include these issues of the bylaws in the Constitution itself. You would include significant detail in the Constitution about how the armed forces should be organized, about the authority of the Prime, the, uh, the prime Minister within the Constitution. And you wouldn't allow it for, for things to be delayed and to, for, you know, for a political party to seek to negotiate its way out of uh, entering into an agreement, okay? Um, and that wasn't done. In, uh, in Iraq, we don't have it in the Constitution, and we don't have it in the bylaws. We have it nowhere. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. This gentleman on the left. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicholas Wade. I'm a Middle East analyst for BBC News. Um, as bad as things got in Iraq in 2006 and 2007, the country did not become what Syria is today. And it strikes me that if any country did have the ingredients, the weaponry available, the uh, conditions to become a civil war fought along proxy war grounds, along ethnic and sectarian lines, it was Iraq. If the constitution is so ineffectual, if the politicians are so corrupt, if the society is so ridden with sectarianism, what was it which held Iraq together and continues to, and do you think it may unravel again? Thank you. For now. Uh, good question. Um, well, one thing characteristic about Iraq that you don't see in Syria today was pretty much the absence of a government back in 06. Um, the government was uh, extremely fragmented with different factions within uh, the political process supporting different armed groups. Perhaps that would account for why, why it, it uh, held together. So it held together because of the chaotic nature of uh, Iraqi politics at the time. Um, also the U.S. role. Don't forget the U.S. were still in town. Um, even though, uh, by all accounts, they stayed clear of the violence and did not interfere until the surge. Um, but that did play a role as well. Uh, furthermore, the fragmentation was also uh, very, quite sharp amongst the uh, militant factions as well, um, as evidenced by the eventual rise of the awakening movement, uh, or the Sahwa. Thank you. This gentleman in front. You just wait for me. Kamal Field from Iraq Institute for Economic Reform. In my view, rule of law is the most important <coughs> element in democracy and economic growth. Without it, we cannot proceed, whether Maliki or not Maliki, uprising demonstrations. What is the role 
of government, non-government organization to promote rule of law in Iraq. You said something negative things about the court in Iraq. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Said? Sure. What civil society, I mean, you, you, sorry, your question was about civil society, is that right? Okay. I mean, what civil society you should do is, is to push for a revision of the Constitution, you know, to keep pushing for it until it happens. You know? The Constitution in its current form will not allow for an independent judiciary. It won't happen because the elements just aren't there. It calls, it calls, it's, it's, it pays lip service to an independent judiciary in the same way that the 1925 Constitution did, the 1958 Constitution did, the 1963, the 1968, 1970. They all said the same thing. The judiciary is independent and this shall be regulated by law. And who controls the law? The president, the king, you know, a very small group of people. So what that means is that those small group of people control the courts. You, know, you need detail in the Constitution about what independence, judicial independence, actually means. You know. And there are lots of examples of how this can be organized. You know, each country has its own system, so in Iraq we should have our own system, but we need a system. We just don't have anything. We have nothing in our Constitution that protects the independence of the judiciary. You know. So we need for that detail to be there. There needs to be something, some way, some mechanism that protects judges from dismissal, from punishment, from being transferred, so on and so forth, in our Constitution, and not for that to be left to the ordinary political process. If you leave it to the ordinary political process, it means that political majorities will capture courts in the way that it's happened today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Ranj. Thanks. Ranj Alaud in London School of Economics. Zaid, I wanted to ask you about the significance of uh, the Constitution in the broader context of Iraq's problems, because on paper you can have the perfect Constitution, uh, you can have the rule of law, but if in practice there are deep-rooted issues like sectarianism, uh, lack of social cohesion, etc., uh, how significant can the Constitution be in that respect? And uh, for Nak, uh, on the Anbar protests, <coughs> uh, can you perhaps give us your thoughts, your on-the-ground thoughts on the uh, relationship between the protesters and Syria? And uh, Haider, can you tell us about the Shia community in, in Iraq and what the, uh, the general perceptions are towards the Syrian conflict. Thank you. Fanat, can we start with you? Um, protesters and Syria. Uh, that link is very important, at least definitely with regards to perceptions. Um, so there is this uh, idea, and it has a lot of traction, that what happens in Syria and what happens in Ambar, these are linked. Um, and what happens in Ambar is necessarily bad because of what's happening in Syria, as in to, put, to speak it plainly, as in it's anti shia Now, whether this is true or not, I doubt the links are, are so strong. Now, last week there was that incident with the uh, convoy being hit, uh, the Syrian convoy being hit within Iraqi territory. Um, so there is definitely some kind of spillover uh, from uh, along that porous border. But whether it actually impacts directly on the um, uh, protests themselves, like in terms of a, of, a, of a tangible link, I don't think so. But in terms of perception, it's very important. And since last year, uh, I remember as early as last year, I was uh, in Iraq and I constantly heard from Sunni politicians uh, going all the way down that when Syria falls, that will be our deliverance. So I think some very unrealistic hopes are being placed on the downfall of Bashar. Conversely, uh, many you'll often hear among Shias that when Bashar falls, uh, this, will be, uh, this will herald the apocalypse for, for the Shia. So it's equally fantastical, I think. Um, That's not a joke, by the way. The apocalypse will be the end of the world. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I'm being serious. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Just on that point, there is actually uh, messianic uh, traditions and prophecies that some Shia do cite uh, when it comes to Syria. Apparently, before the end of the world, um, somebody's going to violently take over power uh, in Syria and Damascus specifically, it'll be a brief uh, period of rule. Uh, the Kurds range will uh, secede or have their own uh, um, sub-state within Syria, and it is used to sort of justify the position. But that's, you know, the crazies. Um, on, 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 I've just recently come back to Iraq, and uh, I was in Najaf, Karbala, and Baghdad. So I spoke to um, the Shia community, uh, you know, senior politicians, senior clergy, and ordinary people. There's obviously differences in how they view uh, uh, the crisis, and that reflects in, 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 in their policies. But sort of the, the unifying um, sort of thread is it's dangerous. If, if Assad falls, um, we have 
again, very porous borders between Iraq and Syria. Uh, many of the tribes are the same tribes, so they have uh, uh, kinship uh, across borders. And they do say, the Syrians say, you know, when you had your troubles, we came and fought with you, you know, against the, the, the Shia government, against the Americans. Why are you not coming uh, to fight uh, uh, with us? Um, the Shia militant groups, or some Shia militant groups, are there in Syria. Um, I, don't, I haven't seen any evidence to suggest they are on the same level as Hezbollah in the sense they're fighting with the Syrian regime in, you know, uh, near the Syrian-Lebanese border. Um, but they are uh, in the Sayyidah Zainab district, which is home to a Shia shrine. Um, the figure I had in Iraq was 1,500. I'm not sure if that's exaggerated or, or downplayed. There are 1,500 Iraqi fighters. And it's worth mentioning this is seen as a legitimate battleground for the Shia in Iraq, and, and indeed across the Shia world. This isn't seen as we are helping Assad crush the Sunni rebels. For the Shia, Samara terrified them. They don't want a repeat of that, and they are fearful that the holy shrine in Damascus and Sayyidah Zainab will be attacked by the FSA or even by uh, Jabhat al-Nusra uh, or the other Al-Qaeda affiliates. We have seen across Syria uh, shrines blown up, tombs blown up. Um, they're not they may not all necessarily be Shia shrines. Some of them may be Alawi shrines or Christian places of worship, but it, it terrifies uh, uh, the Shia, uh, you know, across across the board. Thank you. Said. Well, just very briefly, I mean, it's uh, it's it's a, it's a valid point, and it's it's something that people have to struggle with all over the world. And there's an important question of research that needs to be done as to why this particular group of people came to power in Iraq. You know, you know, they you know they were they were elected. Were the rules of the game fair? You know, there's an there's an interesting question you know that needs to be answered. But you know, you could have an excellent constitution, but if it's not being if it's being applied by people who don't aren't of the right quality, then uh, you know it's uh, it's it's a major problem. And Iraq isn't the only country that has that problem. In South Africa, for example, South Africa is uh, you know to use uh, given that we're talking about religion so much, it's the mecca for constitutionalists. You know, if you're invited to a conference in South Africa, you go. If you're invited to a conference, uh, you know, in uh, in uh, in Accra, you may not go. Um, and, and, and yet in South Africa, they have a great, you know, one of the most advanced constitutions in the world, but they have serious problems in, in decentralization, for example. Serious, serious problems, you know. The lady at the back. Thank you. Uh, hello, Melissa Mubarak, Arabia Monitor. Uh, I have a three-pronged question. The first one is um, for Zaid. Uh, with regards to the constitution, uh, given the imbalances in uh, representation uh, among ethnic and sectarian groups, would we be seeing in Iraq a system similar to that of Lebanon where um, political system becomes sectarian? Um, my second question uh, is with regards to cessation uh, of Kurdistan. Is this a tail risk or is this something that we might fathom in the next few years given heightened tensions? And my third question uh, is to Fanar, with respect to um, how much is the sectarian and ethnic tensions in Iraq affecting, uh, affecting economic growth, and how can that be countered? Thank you. Thanks. Fanar, can we start with you? Uh, how, how much is sectarian tension affecting political growth? Economic growth. Uh, economic growth, I beg your pardon. Um, hmm. I was uh, more interested, actually, in, that, in, the, uh, in the flip side of that relationship, how lack of economic growth is affecting sectarian tensions. Uh, and I think it plays a, a, a big role. Um, and it's easier to, to mobilize on identity issues and play identity cards when uh, the economic situation is as poor as it is, or at least the trickle down is as, as scarce as it is. Um, I mean, I suppose you could say, you could argue that with heightened sectarian tensions comes uh, political instability and, and possibly increase in violence that obviously doesn't do the economy any favors. But as I said, I'm more interested in the flip side of the relationship, and I think um, economic stagnation is, is not good for, for uh, sectarian relations. Did you want to take the other part? I mean, just very briefly, I mean, the, you know, our, our system of government is already sectarian. It's not officially sectarian. There's nothing in the Constitution that provides that things have to be the way they are, but they are the way they are. In the same way that in Lebanon, there's nothing in the Lebanese Constitution that says that the president has to be Maronite, so on and so forth. But that's the way it is today. It may change, you know, but I don't see any prospect for it changing, at least in, in, under the current dynamic. Mm -hmm. Thanks. We've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to start to take a few at a time. Uh, down here, gentlemen there. 
Further on? Further, further down, sorry. Yeah. This guy, yeah. Um, uh, William Petty, Control Risks. Um, uh, I have a great deal of sympathy with Zaid Ali. As British Ambassador during the uh, negotiations on the Constitution, I was in some of these smoke-filled rooms and, uh, and was uh, privy to some of the compromises that uh, had to be made. And uh, I think I certainly, when, uh, when something was uh, closed off for discussion and it was uh, regulated by law, I, for one, thought it was going to be regulated by Parliament in future. So it's quite interesting. There was different interpretations of what regulated by law meant. Uh, it looked like all the politicians were essentially um, putting uh, that to be uh, decided in the future. So I have a great deal of sympathy. I do think the Constitution was rushed. Uh, uh, and I know that um, as British ambassador, I know the American ambassador was under the same pressure from Washington. Get a constitution, get it voted, and yeah. make sure these Iraqi politicians come through. So I have a great deal of sympathy. On the issue of decentralization, I was, uh, we were privy to a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, as a Scot, a unionist, I uh, may say so, uh, <laughs> as a Scot, we are often described as the, the Kurds of Great Britain, uh, <laughs> uh, troublesome mountain people who are very That's good at so protecting their own interests. Uh, and so... But the, but the issue, and one of the things we, we talked about during this constitutional process was asymmetric federalism. It is possible to recognize special nature of certain historical situations, whether it's in the Kurdish region or whether it's in Scotland, where you can have different constitutional arrangements with respect to federalism to the center. And one of the, one of the issues, and I'd like Zaid Ali's uh, and any of the other panelists' view on this, one of the fears was that uh, we talked to the Shia, the Shia didn't know whether they wanted three regions of the south or one big region of nine. I remember having uh, um, um, long discussions with um, uh, Abdulaziz al-Hakim about this, about one big nine Shia region. And the Sunni fear that this would lead to the split up of Iraq on sectarian grounds. If you had a nine province Shia region, then you'd have to have a three province uh, Sunni region, you'd have the Kurds, and then you'd have a sort of federal Baghdad. How, could you, how do you get to centralization, decentralization that recognizes that the Kurds are slightly different? I mean, I don't know, that may not be accepted in Iraq, but I think it's a pretty much a reality, that recognizes that Kurds are slightly different, that doesn't lead to a sectarian divide. And I suppose the other question is, is there any active discussion going on in Iraq? I'm a bit out of touch on changing the constitution, remedy, remedying some of the faults that you have so clearly identified. Thank you. And the two gentlemen in the row behind. Well, that was a lot. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Steele. If this was 2008 and we were talking Iraq five years on, we'd have been constantly talking about somebody called Mokhtar al-Sada. It's remarkable that he hasn't been mentioned at all, not even when uh, in the Sabre you asked Dr. Fanar, is the sort of populist person who's raising issues against Maliki on service delivery or lack of. So my question maybe shows that I'm totally out of date. I did read somewhere that... Mokhtar al-Sadr had said he was in sympathy with the Sunni protests, although I don't know whether he was more specific than Sistani has been. So could you tell me if that is true? And secondly, more widely, obviously, what is Mokhtar al-Sadr doing? Does he have much political power in the moment? And what about all these young men who are in the Jaish al-Mahdi? Uh, what are they doing? What is their position? Thank you. Thanks. Martin Woolacott, uh, Guardian leader writer. Um, in most discussions of the defects of a uh, democracy, uh, an inadequate democracy, there is some mention of the role of the media, whether they're in a healthy state or not. And we know, we certainly know from other countries like Yugoslavia, which went in, into a slide into sectarianism and worse, that bad media play a very serious role in reinforcing sectarianism, and good media play a very serious role in contesting it. So I'd like to ask any of the panel uh, who are interested in that issue to comment <coughs> on the state of the media in Iraq today and on the chances that better media can bring about or help bring about the renewal that you have all touched on and in particular Zaid al-Ali has said is the only way out. Thank you very much. Haider, could we come to you about what's Muqtada al-Sadr's strategy here with the protests? I mean, over the last couple of years, the Sadwists have restyled themselves. They've become a lot less radical. Uh, they've become ostensibly a lot more inclusive of the other political parties. Uh, and Muqtada himself has, has turned from a radical leader into a sort of 
uh, a force for moderation, which is, is ironic in itself. The point I'd, I'd say about Muqtada and, and other Shia partners of Maliki, such as Hakim, when they um, constantly try to calm down the tensions and say, you know, these things shouldn't escalate, and I'm referring to the political leaders like Muqtada and Hakim, it's important to bear in mind that as Dr. Fana mentioned, that the protests are a godsend for Maliki. The more the sectarian tensions increase, the more Maliki becomes popular with the Shia base, even those who would have voted uh, uh, for Hakim and Sadr. So in, in their attempts to calm down the situation, they also want to calm the, um, uh, reduce uh, the support uh, that Maliki is getting. And of course, if it turns violent, it's another issue. Then people with militias will become a lot more uh, powerful vis-a-vis -vis Maliki. But as long as it's br brinksmanship and, and everyone's just grandstanding, um, I think we need to look at the um, public calls for moderation and, and inclusiveness in a more sort of cynical uh, lens. Thank you. The media question is an interesting one. Um, Fana's book uses a lot of more populist media sources, looking at YouTube videos and popular songs and poetry. What role did that play in the sectarian dynamic? Um, I think it reflected uh, what was happening on the ground. Um, now, with regards to media today, and even back then, there's a strong echo chamber effect. Uh, depending on, on your prejudice or your biases, you will follow a certain number of media channels that will echo the, a familiar line. Uh, it's unfortunate that these positions can be delineated uh, along ethno-sectarian lines or identity lines. Uh, there is um, fairly healthy independent media in Iraq. However, uh, there's shortage of funding, there is uh, government pressure sometimes. It's more sort of, uh, more akin to a blog rather than, than uh, a national newspaper, for example. Um, yeah. Thank you. Answer on that. Did you want to respond to that? Sure, question? yeah. So on, on, the, on the discussions that you mentioned, so it, I mean, my understanding of the discussions that, were, that took place in 2005, and my understanding, and at least my, 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 my belief, is that asymmetrism is fine for Iraq and for any country. You can always have um, regions that have their own relationship to the center that's different to, 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 to other regions. Um, the problem with the way, and, and Spain was a, a model that was studied in detail in Iraq, the, the Spanish model, but that, that has its own problems. But the problem is that in, in Iraq, the, the way in which the constitution was drafted was this fortress-like mentality. It wasn't, the issue wasn't that we're going to create regions and these regions will take care of uh, service delivery in their, in their, in their areas. The idea was that each region will become a fortress for their people, will protect its people from everyone else. And when that's the mentality, you're not talking about a country anymore. You're talking about separate entities. You know, they may nominally be part of a single state, but it's a, fic it's a fiction. Um, you know, the discussion should be about decentralization or federalism, and the discussion should be one based on good governance about the delivery of services, and not one of, you know, I'm terrified of you, and therefore I should find a mechanism to protect myself and my interests and my family from you as my enemy. If, you're, if you consider the other in your country to be your enemy, then you may as well not be talking about the country at all anymore. You know? um, and whether or not there's a dynamic today to, be, to reform the Constitution, the answer to that is no. You know? I'm, I think, the only person that keeps talking about it. I talk about it a lot, by the way. You know? I get a lot of practice. You know? But uh, you know, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not the dynamic. The dynamic today is all about you know, protests and uh, sectarianism and Sunnis and Shias. I've disused the S words, but um, you know, that's, that's the dynamic. It's not about governance and so on and so forth. The poor are neglected in Iraq. Service delivery is not the priority. You know, the priority is just about sects. That's the priority. Thank you. Dr. Zaha. Firstly, the issue of corruption. Um, corruption has a long history in Iraq. During the former regime, especially during the 10 years of sanctions, the uh, ministries were riddled with corruption because people, m the employees basically could not get a fair wage, so everyone turned a blind eye. Now those same ministries are there, so corruption is there, it has a history, it's not new, firstly. Secondly, corruption um, with the national government of national unity, Every ministry is responsible for its own ministry. Every minister is responsible for his own ministry. Prime Minister Maliki has only two ministers in this current government, Minister of Higher Education, Minister of 
sports, youth and sports, and their performance is actually quite good, which means that what I'm trying to say is it's not really accurate to blame Maliki on every piece of corruption that's in the country. It is a very complicated issue. My question to the panel is how, and, and there have been a lot of, you know, the, the um, anti-corruption committees, etc. How can we get over this complex situation of um, corruption, one. The second really important issue is the question of services. Again, it's been talked about the government has abysmal, uh, abysmal failure, okay? Facts of the Ministry of, um, uh, uh, of Education, 900 schools underway, 2,300 schools uh, repatriated um, or rehabilitated, 480 kilometers of uh, roads in the past two years, etc., etc. These are facts. But, again, services. Every minister is responsible for services. Maliki does not have the right to, um, uh, account, to hold account any minister if he is from another block. So, again, now the other thing is political wrangling. Um, the infrastructure law, which was put to parliament, which would have given 40 billion to build infrastructure, was opposed by the Iraqi and others. Number two, the th final, my final thing is the protests. And how is the government, so again my question is how can we overcome the problem of services given the complex situation? My third question is the protests in Ambar. The government has put forward, has put together a ministerial council headed by a very powerful prime minister Deputy Prime Minister, who has visited the regions, met the uh, heads of the, of the protests in the Iraqi channel. There are thousands of demands that are being met for these protesters. How is the government dealing with the protests Thank and you. how can it deal Great. better? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we are running out of time and I do not want to stand between a room full of people and lunch. So I'm going to ask the panel to give their final remarks and I'm really sorry to everyone I didn't get to. Uh, well, I'll, I'll end by answering part of your question. Uh, I, I wasn't here for the first panel, but I, I'd be very surprised if anyone would, would be foolish enough to just place it all on Maliki. Th this isn't about Maliki. The entire system is flawed. You mentioned corruption. It's, uh, it's a cancer flowing through the veins, not just of the state, but of society. It's absolutely staggering, the level of corruption. Um, you ask how, how to get over services? Well, it, it's linked to cor get over corruption first. Now, how to get over corruption reminds me of what Zaid said about uh, the um, uh, constitutional uh, reform uh, process. As in, why should suddenly, after all these years, these same people suddenly reach enlightenment? Uh, I cannot see, uh, I, I have no idea how to get over corruption in Iraq. It's so pervasive, it's so embedded, it might be a generational issue. Hayda. I mean, I don't have anything to say on this specific topic, but just two things I missed uh, previously on the southern secession and, and, and Hakim's sort of vision. I think the Shia uh, uh, um, voters um, voted very decisively against a one uh, southern province. And Majlis Laala, the uh, Iraqi Islamic uh, Supreme Council, were literally relegated to political irrelevance in the 2009 provincial elections. And of course, there were other reasons, one of them being Maliki used a nationalist ticket and he benefited of the charge of the night's uh, offensive uh, against the Shia militias. But the, the vast majority of the Shia, uh, certainly the ones that I speak to, do not want a separate uh, uh, province for themselves. Maybe the exception is Basra. But Basra, even then, is not for sectarian reasons. The Shia you speak to in Basra, as with the Sunnis in Basra, they do want decentralization. They do want to move their project forward. And they see Baghdad as a... Uh, a barrier to this, but even in Basra, the calls for federalism are not uh, based on sectarianism as it was. Uh, on the issue, one of the um, ladies asked about the um, Kurdish secession. From what, I've, from what I can gather, there seems to be two distinct Shia lines. The religious line, and, it, and it's historical, the Shia fatwa in the 60s against the Iraqi central government killing the Kurds, and the Kurds continuously uh, um, uh, use this fatwa to show of the, the, the historical relations the Shia had with the Kurds. And it was a very clear fatwa, you know, you're not, you, you do not fight uh, the Kurds. 
uh, and a lot of Iraqi soldiers deliberately misfired in the war between the federal forces and the Kurdish forces. The religious establishment does want to see a return of good relations. Um, I know specifically there are delegations that have been sent from Najaf uh, to Erbil to try and work it out. But the problem is the Shia political class uh, don't see eye to eye uh, with the religious establishment. The attitude, and it comes off very blatantly if you speak to a Shia politician, especially if he's uh, in the state of law coalition. Uh, when you ask them, are you not afraid of the Kurds you know, uh, uh, um, going it alone, the two immediate reactions are good luck, good riddance. Uh, good luck because even if they do manage to break off from Iraq, uh, this, well, Syrian is, is no longer part of the equation, but the Turks and Iranians certainly aren't going to keep quiet with very large Kurdish um, uh, populations. Um, and good riddance because if the uh, um, Kurds do break off, the Shia are going to jump from 55, 60 to, to, to around 80 percent. So there, there's going to be, you know, now there is sort of tensions when it comes to um, how many Shia there are, how many Sunnis there are, how many Kurds there are in Iraq. If the Kurds do go alone and, and Iraq becomes uh, um, uh, an Iraq without the Kurds, the Shia will be uh, undisputable uh, majority. And, and this is dangerous. This, you know, the, 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 the cooler heads, the calmer heads, the wiser heads, they don't want this to happen. But unfortunately, politicians are are short-sighted and, and they want to see immediate gains and they're in power and they want to maximize this power. So it's a, it's a very delicate situation. Thank you, Haider. And finally, Zayn. Sure. So, I mean, uh, just to echo something that Fanata said earlier, I'm also not focusing on Maliki as being a source of uh, all of Iraq's ills. You know, it's, uh, that's, that's, not, that's not the issue. But I also don't want to excuse him for also for, 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 for failed performance as well. You know, corruption existed, Iraq has existed for a long period of time. It was definitely very, very bad during the 1990s but it doesn't excuse current, behavior, current performance today. I mean, it's, it's a long time ago. The 90s were a long time ago now, you know? And a lot of the things that have taken place over the past few years, uh, some of them had nothing to do with Maliki, but some of them did, you know? So I can uh, cite one very specific example, which is the Integrity Commission, which was headed by a very respected judge, uh, Rahim al-Urgaidi. For those who are interested and who, uh, who care about these things, he was Shia, okay? He was a great guy, you know, a pioneering judge, uh, anti-corruption, uh, uh, judge and he was doing a great job in his position and he was pushed out by Maliki. He was forced to leave and he's uh, currently living in fear now in Iraq for his life, you know. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely not a uh, Maliki problem. Maliki is a symptom of, uh, you know, he's part of a larger, larger uh, problem. Um, and then also to echo something that, uh, that Haider mentioned earlier and that I also wanted to, to echo before, is that during the negotiations in 2005, during the constitutional negotiations, um, the, 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 the position that Iski had, um, the, that Al-Hakim had, uh, was not reflective of their genuine weight in the community. That was one of the main problems. And, uh, and the, the, the understanding in the international community that he represented, that Al-Hakim represented, the entire Shia community was a gross distortion. So when he uh, gave that uh, momentous uh, speech in uh, Najaf in August of 2005, in which he declared that he was in favor of forming a mega region in the south of the country. Everyone understood that to mean that that is what the Shia wanted. Okay? But yet, going back to Al-Maliki, Maliki was one of the first people that came out very strongly at that time saying, we are opposed. We are not in favor. We are not in favor of breaking Iraq up into Bantustans. Okay? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Muqtar Sadr, you know, to give credit to where credit is due, um, even if it's unpleasant, also said the same thing. Okay? Uh, you know, so, and today, Al Hakim has a very small proportion of the Shia vote. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we're in, as a, but the, the, sadly, because the Constitution has now locked us into this dynamic, and it was written by these people who have, uh, at the time, uh, controlled the process and who had extremist views about federalism, mm -hmm. and we're locked into it. We can't break out. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your patience. Please join me in thanking our speakers.